Okay, so the most common use of the principles of oligopoly theory that we were developing yesterday is to competition policy. Competition policies are roughly policies that try to keep that theta parameter we were talking about yesterday down in various ways. In particular, today we're going to focus on merger policy. Uh, in most developed countries, uh, if two companies want to merge, they have to be approved by the government. And I was a bit involved with the design of the new standards that are used for deciding whether these mergers should be approved or not in the United States and the United Kingdom. But before we go through details of how these policies work, I want to discuss the case uh, for and against such policies. Uh, and the case for them is uh, basically originates with Cournot's theorem. Uh, as well as some other results in favor of competition. And we'll talk about uh, some of the evidence in this direction, in particular Bresnahan and Race's 1991 empirical study. We'll then talk about some of the downsides of competition, particularly in selection markets, and some of the pros and cons of competition policy. We'll then talk about antitrust enforcement around the world and how merger policy is conducted in practice uh, through the modern merger guidelines. And then, um, finally, some of the most recent advances in uh, merger theory and empirics. Mike, the red button thing is already flashing, which is really bad. Right. bad um, okay. So, competition um, is, uh, we're going to talk about some of the limitations of competition. But first, I want to anchor you in the basic idea of why uh, competition is thought to be beneficial. So remember that in Cournot's model, as n approaches infinity, theta approaches zero, and therefore price converges to marginal cost. Um, so as the number of firms grow large, uh, pricing will converge to a uh, marginal cost. This basic idea is one of the most fundamental results in, <coughs> in economics and the foundation of most of the theory of perfect competition as well as the basis of most antitrust and competition policies. <coughs> now note that mergers mechanically will decrease N. And uh, this is the basic reason why uh, agencies try to reduce the number of, um, of uh, mergers. And in particular, when N is relatively small, the change in 1 over N is relatively large. And therefore, especially when an industry is concentrated, agencies are often worried about uh, mergers taking place. Now, of course, theta is just one measure of the degree of competition. Uh, and in other models where theta is determined, uh, sorry, n is only one determinant of theta. We also talked about collusion. We talked about differentiated products, et cetera. Um, but in these other contexts, mergers will typically tend to be bad as well. So, for example, in the differentiated product Nash and Price's model, it was 1 minus the aggregate diversion ratio that was uh, the measure of theta. And uh, in that context, mergers will be harmful because they will create more uh, diversion. Sorry, they will reduce the amount of diversion uh, to other firms' products. Um, but also, uh, competition policy in this context tries to reduce unnecessary branding that would differentiate products and reduce the diversion between them. Uh, under collusion and conjectures, uh, the, what determines the amount of market power is how much firms think that others re retaliate against them. And competition policy tries to reduce the extent to which firms are able to do the things that they want to do in order to collude uh, in order to reduce the amount of conjectured uh, retaliation that would lead to higher prices. Uh, you know, breaking up communication among firms, uh, friendships among firm uh, uh, owners are other ways of doing this. Um, in search, what tends to make market power is that firms, that uh, consumers can't see the prices of all the firms. So government policies can try to make prices more apparent to induce more competition. And this is the goal of a lot of consumer protection uh, laws and authorities. Heterogeneous costs are another potential source of market power. Um, and by encouraging more entry, it makes it more likely that the second lowest firm is 
a second highest or second lowest cost firm is close to the first lowest cost firm and thereby holds down prices. So in all of these cases, mergers are going to raise theta in different ways in each case, and we'll go in detail through the differentiated products Nash and Prices case in a bit. Okay. So um, these are uh, um, all these cases will have different quantitative relationships between the number of firms and the degree of competition. And so obviously something that's of interest is trying to empirically measure what is the relationship between the number of firms and the amount of competition. And Bresnahan and Race had a clever approach to trying to do this. So um, they noted that as a city grows larger, as a market, you know, geographic market grows larger, it can support more firms. You only have like one dentist usually in a small, really small town, but as the town gets larger, there will be more and more dentists, right? And so they um, called the number of people uh, that are necessary to support N firms, capital S sub N. And little s sub N is the number of people uh, so you basically can look as a you know, city grows larger, how many uh, people how many uh, people working in a given profession are there. You can use that to form the number of people that are necessary to support a, no a certain number of uh, firms or uh, workers. Um, and then you can say that little s sub n is the, uh, the sort of number of people per firm that are necessary to support that many firms, right? Okay, now if the prices that firms were, imagine every firm had the same cost of entering, then the prices that firms would need in order to defray their fixed costs um, would be larger if they had a smaller number of customers. And conversely, if they had lower prices, they'd need more customers to defray their fixed costs, right? And um, in, if prices were completely constant as the number of firms increased, then you would think that the number of consumers per firm needed to support that number of firms should be constant as the number of firms gets larger. On the other hand, if prices fall, then um, this number should increase, right? Because if the prices go down, then the number of customers you're going to need to support the second firm is going to be more than twice that you need to support the first firm. Right? Okay. Um, now, of course, there's other reasons why that could occur. It could be that, first, for, for example, the first person in the town likes the town the most and therefore is willing to work for the least amount of money. Or they uh, have lower costs in the second firm. But at least this is a reasonable starting point. And so what Bresnahan and Race did is they found um, five different professions in small rural towns and they asked how many people and how many professionals were there in each town and in particular at what point does the S start to level out and that was like their interpretation of when theta was getting very close to zero prices were getting close to perfect competition and so here's what they found this is S sub 5 over S sub n so S sub n should actually be decreasing here rather than increase uh, sorry the vertical axis should be decreasing rather than <coughs> increasing and what you see is that about around three firms, you're getting very little further decline as uh, the number of firms gets greater. And this is for druggists, tire dealers, doctors, dentists, and plumbers. Okay. So um, that suggests that around three to five firms is the point where like close to perfect competition has kicked in, at least in these contexts. Okay. So, so far, um, con, con, uh, competition we've interpreted as uh, being almost all good, right? But now I want to talk about um, cases when there are real externalities across firms, not just these pecuniary externalities that could make competition harmful, right? Um, so before we studied uh, the, the comparison between monopoly and uh, perfect competition when there was selection, for example, but now I want to put this into an oligopoly model. And in particular, I want to imagine that each firm gets a representative sample of all the consumers that are in the market. So in that case, their profits are going to be a price which depends on the total quantity times the quantity that they have 
minus, oh, sorry, this should be the quantity that they have, times the average cost of people in the market. So then if average cost is defined as this and marginal cost is defined as this, uh, what are firms' uh, first order conditions going to be? Um, well, uh, there, as before, we're going to have theta showing up multiplying over epsilon for the market power effect. But now, how much of the marginal cost versus the average cost firms internalize is also going to be determined by theta. Why is that? Well, imagine that I'm a monopolist. Well, then, as I increase my production, I know that that's going to, I'm going to take into account the effect that has on the type of people in the market. If I'm a perfect competitor, on the other hand, I'm just going to be stealing average consumers and not thinking at all about the impact that that's having on the total market, right? And if we have theta that's in between, that will smoothly map in between these two things, just as theta before smoothly mapped between perfect competition and monopoly. Okay. So that says that um, we get a weighted average, not just of price and marginal revenue, but also of marginal cost and average cost. Um, so uh, what's going to be the optimal market structure in this case? Um, well, that's going to depend on uh, whether we have adverse selection or advantageous selection. So Arvid, what w is going to be the optimal market structure under adverse selection? Well, under adverse selection, it's that the good customers like the good ones come in first. So you will have a Come in, the bad ones come in first, right? Under uh, adverse selection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So the, the bad ones come in first, so that means that the good ones come later, so your marginal cost curve is going to go shitting down, yeah. your average cost curve. So in that case, you would want to, you will, if you raise your price, thereby drawing the person who is in a different way, they will have positive extra now, because you're decreasing your average cost. That's right. So, so you would want to have an, uh, a merger to take that into account. Would you? Um, well, no, no, <laughs> well, so I mean, what did we find was the uh, was monopoly or competition better under adverse selection? Just be clear. What do you mean by adverse selection? Uh, well, exactly what we studied in the regulation lecture about adverse selection. So a declining. Cost curve, marginal cost curves, just like Arvid said. The first people into the market are the most expensive, the next people are less expensive. Um, can you call that I would, yeah. let's say, let's say perfect competition. Is the best? Because if, if, if you're marginal, because then you get to the lowest point. Not sure about it. Yeah, so. You want competition, just as we said before, and the reason is that, that you were on the right track, Robert. The reason is that uh, perfect competition already supplies too little under adverse selection, and monopoly will only supply even less because perfect competition makes no profits. So monopoly to make profits has to charge an even higher price and therefore supply less. And therefore, we want to keep theta as low as possible. How about with uh, advantageous selection? What do you think, Luke? In that case, Monopoly has the potential to be better. It's yep. not obvious it'll be better, yep. but it's kind of nice to exclude those bad customers, yep. which monopolists will do. Yeah. But what about the optimal value of theta? What do you think about that? I see. Uh, so the optimal value of theta wouldn't be, would it be zero? Yes. Uh, so it'd be a function of just how uh, adverse the selection is. A advantageous. Or, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Just how yeah. this selection is. Uh, yeah. And there'd be some segment you don't want in the market and you pick theta such like that you exclude that segment and then nobody nobody else. It stops there. Yeah, so that's right. So you can do this at home, but it turns out that the optimal value of theta is always strictly between zero and one, and it's equal to the amount of advantageous selection, as you were saying, Luke, divided by the marginal surplus plus the amount of advantageous selection. So it's like how big selection is relative to market power. So the more that select, more powerful selection is relative to like the potential market power, the higher theta you want. 
Okay, so this gives you a little picture of that. Uh, under adverse selection, <coughs> sorry, under advantageous selection, we already went through, you know, adverse selection we, is, is clear. Under advantageous selection, perfect competition takes you here, monopoly takes you here. The social optimum is in between at the point where marginal cost equals demand. So how do we get there? Well, we can allow the marginal cost to move a little bit towards the, away from the average cost by having theta a bit higher. And we can let the demand move a little bit towards the marginal revenue by having theta a bit higher. And then we can get to the optimum here. Okay. Now, um, so far, we held, we've held product design fixed and only looked at the effect of competition on the total quantity. Now, to think about pro product design, I'm going to assume what's called a covered market, which is basically that hoteling line where everyone had to vote, where everyone has to buy one of the products, right? <coughs> Um, so now, instead of people just having a position on the hoteling line, which I'm going to call D, I'm also going to have them have a type, theta. And the key assumption I'm going to make is that theta is independent of where you are along the line. So that the people who are just indifferent between the two firms along the hoteling line are going to have the same distribution of costs and bene benefits from the product as everybody else. So. Uh, we can then call theta i, the people who are buying the product from i, and partial theta, the people who are just switching between the two firms. Let me see. Do I, no. Okay. Um, so by the standard argument, the number of people who are marginal, that m thing I had before, is just going to be inversely proportional to the transport cost, the cost of people moving across. Because if it's not costly for people to move to the other side, then there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be willing to switch. And you can just use the characterization that we had before uh, of you know, the difference between the marginal and the averages, sorry, the marginal uh, utility that someone gets from an additional unit of the non-price characteristic minus the marginal cost uh, has to be equal to the covariance times the number of people on the margin. So here's the number of people on the margin. Here's the difference between the marginal and average people's cost. And now, remember, because the people who are switching are representative of the whole population, we don't have to ask whether this is along the margin or the average. It's just the whole population. So the difference between the average and the marginal, uh, the marginal uh, utility and marginal cost is going to be equal to the covariance between people's marginal <coughs> utility and their cost divided by t. So that says that if the most costly people are also the people who like that characteristic the most, as the amount of competition increases and T decreases, that's going to lead to a big reduction in the amount of that characteristic because you don't want to try to attract those people. Okay. So um, as you get towards perfect competition in particular, this is going to go to zero. So in order to keep this satisfied, covariance is going to have to go to zero. So as we get towards perfect competition, the, co the covariance between marginal utility and cost for any characteristic that you can change has to be equal to zero. That is, this is what's called cream skimming. It says that as we get towards perfect competition, I'm going to have a very strong incentive to try to steal the most valuable people from, my, from the other firm. So if there's any covariance between how much people like something and how valuable they are to me, then I'm going to drive that thing to the point where it eliminates that covariance. Okay. Now, with insurance, there are at least two drivers of mu prime. Uh, let, let's let the non-price characteristic be how much insurance we offer, for example. Um, one driver is how much I value insurance, how, like, uh, how risk averse I am or uh, how much risk I, I'm facing. Another driver is the average loss that I'm going to take on people. Um, and if there's a sufficiently negative correlation between these, okay, and the average loss I'm going to take, the average, uh, you know, medical expenditure I'm going to make, that's something which is going to impact the cost that I have to the firm. How much I value insurance or how much risk I have, that doesn't uh, impact the firm at all. Now, if these things are negatively correlated enough, that can lead this to be equal to zero <coughs> even when there's positive insurance. Because when I increase the amount of insurance, that might bring in people who are sicker, but it might also bring in people who just have a higher value for insurance. That was sort of like what we talked about with advantageous selection versus adverse selection before, right? 
Unfortunately, in the calibration, it turns out that actually the correlation between these things is often positive. And the reason is that even though it might be the case that more hypochondriac people are more healthy, it's also the case that, more hypochond that unhealthy people have a larger value for insurance just because they're very uncertain about how much they're going to be paying. They have a big risk as well as a big average expenditure. Um, so uh, on the one hand, that means that this is never going to be positive. Sorry, it's never going to be equal to zero when we have positive insurance. That reducing the amount of insurance is always going to be, on average, selecting the unhealthy people. And that's going to lead people to continually lower their insurance until we get to no insurance at all. So uh, this uh, attempt to attract and cream skim is going to drive all insurance out of the market. So that sounds really, really bad, right? Maybe you said the death, the death spiral, right? Well, but it's a little bit different than the one before. Because the death spiral that we talked about before was when there was just a one insurance plan and not that you could adjust these non-price characteristics. But this is even stronger. It's like it's the death of a thousand cuts. You just keep undercutting it until, yeah. Okay. However, this sort of cream skimming can also drive out price discrimination. Why is that? Well, remember that what we said before was that um, this selection effect will lead you to try to lower your price down to cost to, to try to attract those wealthy consumers who might switch over to the other firm if you're charging them for their inframarginal units of consumption at that store. And that, we think, is a good thing. We think it's good to drive the costs of the goods down to, um, price of the goods uh, down to cost. Um, so what this shows is that cream skimming can lead to the elimination of insurance. But it can also lead to the elimination of price discrimination, which, uh, or at least the elimination of the distortions caused by price discrimination by driving price to cost. So um, uh, the question is, uh, is this overall a good or a bad thing? Well, um, it really depends on what our social goals are. So why is it we view it as beneficial that you eliminate the um, that you eliminate the price discrimination, well, we want everyone to bear exactly the cost associated with them buying the goods. But we view that as harmful in insurance, that everyone bears exactly the cost. We want to cushion people from those costs. right? And so depending on whether we think it's a good thing that we do the redistribution that we know that from the problem set price discrimination brings, or whether we think it's bad that we do that because we want everyone to bear exactly their cost is going to be what determines um, whether this is beneficial, whether this sort of cream skimming is beneficial or not. So a lot depends on the evaluative perspective that we take, whether we're thinking about the insurance value uh, or whether we're thinking about the incentives that it creates. And we'll talk more about that trade-off between insurance and incentives, the sort of the heart of the redistribu redistributive trade-off uh, in the next class. Okay. However, if we do want the market to provide insurance, if we do want it to provide uh, this sort of redistribution, then we may need to sort of wall off from competition some dimensions of products which provide that redistribution, like how generous insurance coverage is. And that's, I think, one of the really key reasons why in Obamacare you're only allowed to provide plans that have a minimum level of insurance, even though that's obviously creating a huge amount of political <coughs> uncertainty and uh, <coughs> contention recently. Okay, so there's ups and downs of competition, uh, but in practice there's lots of policies that try to keep uh, theta down. And before we go into talking about the details of those policies, I want to first talk about some of the broad <coughs> Uh, pros and cons of those policies. So on the pro side, um, in addition to um, the, uh, the benefits to reducing prices to consumers, uh, like in Corno's theorem, it can also uh, stop the assembly of too much 
um, political power or too much cultural power by one entity. So I don't know if you guys remember from the last class that picture of the octopus. It wasn't just showing Standard Oil squeezing consumers and suppliers. It was also showing them squeezing politicians, right? And you might be worried that a firm that assembles too much power is going to have too much political influence related to the first problem set that you guys did this year. Uh, and that that imbalance might lead to bad policy making. Um, it can also uh, um, it can also be useful, and this is uh, uh, something that some previous problem sets had you guys look at. Um, for or maybe you even have one this year. I think you have one this year that looks at, at this. Uh, it can um, be a way. Okay, so if we stop firms from merging. Uh, we can discourage people from entering into the industry as a copycat to an existing firm because they'll know that if they enter then there will be such fierce competition that they won't make any profits. Whereas firms that are entering with a product that's very different than the products that already exist aren't going to be hurt by that at all. So it can be a way so of sort of selectively attracting into the industry firms with very new innovative and different products and therefore it might be helpful in the process of creative destruction. It can also reduce too big to fail concerns in financial uh, markets. On the other hand, on the downside, it can impede economies of scale and potentially reduce some of the profits that you get from innovation if, if the market's too competitive. Uh, when there are complementarities because, bec across products, as we'll talk about in a, uh, in a week, um, it can uh, reduce firms' ability to coordinate effectively. Um, it can um, dynamic entry into industries might already take care of a lot of the things that the merger might create as a problem. You know, so once uh, a firm's merged, there may be incentives for other firms to enter the industry to compete with them, and uh, that might solve a lot of this problem. There's also issues of informational coordination across firms that competition policy can inhibit. And you'll look at those in the problem set. Now, these are obviously very exotic factors that are usually not considered uh, in standard competition policy analysis. But I think a lot of them are actually really important to competition policy and are not usually uh, considered. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done in uh, bringing those things in. Well, what but do you mean by informational coordination? Uh, you'll, you'll look at it on the problem set. So it's basically like, you know, firms might want to tell each other this, okay, so a firm might like learn that they're really well suited to this industry and to say to another firm, stay out of this industry, this is the right place for me. Now that sounds collusive, but actually it could save a lot of money on the other firm investing and figuring out whether it's good at this industry if it already knows that there's someone who's there serving it and they could instead invest that in figuring another area that's not being so well so served. So you're basically saying that the firm doesn't have to pay the cost of learning the end drawer of the cost of the yeah. Exactly. Okay. And the, the problem set will have you deal with something like that. But the, 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 the bait conventional wisdom, the standard view on competition policy, is that all these things are second order and that the first order thing is the standard Cournot theorem logic. So the US led the way uh, in establishing competition policy um, with the uh, Clayton Antitrust Act. So Sherman Antitrust Act made it illegal for firms to collude, but then what firms realized is, oh, we can just merge. Uh, and so the US then brought in the Clayton Antitrust Act to review uh, firms that wanted to merge with each other. Um, so the Clayton Act regulates legal combinations, whereas the Sherman Act makes illegal combinations that are collusive. Now, um, a natural question is why we don't just block all mergers um, and we obviously talked about some reasons that might be the case, but the standard one is that there might be economies of scale and that it may be efficient for firms to merge if this can reduce their costs, it might even benefit consumers. A classic example of this that's given is AT&T wanted to merge with T-Mobile and they said, well, you know, if we merge then everybody's going to be able to use the networks of both and that will make us a more efficient company. 
And agencies have to weigh this type of argument against the anti-competitive effects. And there are several agencies that are involved with issues like this, but there are two primary ones in the United States. Does anyone know what those are? Other than Jack. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division and the Federal Trade Commission are in charge of reviewing uh, mergers. And merger, merging companies are forced to pre-notify uh, the agencies of their intentions. And at that point, the agencies subpoena data in several stages. They first look superficially to see whether they think it might be a problem. If they think it's a problem, then they get more data. They take longer to get back and it goes through a theory, series of stages like that. And there are a team of about 150 PhD economists between the FTC and the DOJ who review these. And most of the mergers they just approve, but uh, and a, some of them, they come to some settlement that resolves the issue or the companies voluntarily agree not to merge. And occasionally there will be a conflict and they'll be forced to go to court. It's now, it's yeah. Perhaps the largest concentration of PhD economists, maybe. Yeah, Toulouse is pretty big, too. Yeah. They have, like, the concentration shares. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Uh, so this is perhaps one of the most sophisticated forms of economic regulation in the world. Um, and it's been copied by most developed countries. So the European Commission now has a very large team as well, as do many of the Commonwealth countries like the UK, Australia, New Zealand, etc. These policies are much more uh, primitive and unstructured in the developing world currently. In many, no law against mergers even exists, so Peru is a leading example of this, though I think that they have finally passed uh, a law that they're just starting to implement now. In others, there's a law, but there's minimal infrastructure um, because uh, and either there's effectively no control or uh, it's very ineffective because they don't have um, cartel uh, enforcement. Others have some structure in place, but they don't have very many economists to really analyze this stuff. So for example, Bogota, I mean, in Colombia, I think it only has one uh, PhD economist or, and he's only half time working with their uh, antitrust authorities. Um, and they're just starting to write guidelines uh, for mergers that are based on uh, economics. And a few developing countries have been really trying to develop sophisticated infrastructures, including China, Brazil, and Chile. In other words, uh, it's pretty heterogeneous what these institutions are across the world. And I think that like the biggest priority in competition policy from my perspective is not refining down the sort of second order issues that are is the focus of much of antitrust economics in the United States, but instead trying to bring the basic institutions of antitrust policies to developing countries. Yeah, Donnie. What happens when U.S. multinationals are going to merge with multinational like, uh, companies abroad that don't have any impact in the U.S.? Does the DOJ and FTC look at that stuff? So that's a huge, huge problem. If you're like one of these little country, companies in Latin, countries in Latin America, you're like Peru, and there's some giant merger taking place that's going to affect all of Latin America. How are you, Peru, supposed to go about blocking that, right? So that's a huge problem, is like international coordination on antitrust matters for small open economies. Uh, that's what the EU has done for the European countries, but a lot of, you know, uh, Latin American or developing world countries don't have that power capability, and so they end up being the victims of a lot of potentially quite anti-competitive mergers. Even given the World Trade Organization, Yeah, they don't do anything, nothing on that. In fact, they can sometimes go the opposite way. They can sometimes try to strike down uh, local, rules. local rules because they say that there are ways of like discouraging foreign acquisitions or something like that. Yeah, Luke. Have there ever been responses like, you guys have merged, so we're just going to block big company A from selling their products in our, com in our country? I mean, you could try to do that, but uh, that would get you in trouble with the WTO. That would, you know. So you see, free trade is not all free, you know. Uh, free trade has a uh, fair, I mean like, you know, you, you look at someone like Peru, a country like Peru, and like they opened up to trade, all these U.S. companies came in and cartelized whatever industries weren't already cartelized in the Peruvian economy. And if Peru tries to do anything against it, the U.S. ambassador comes in 
to the office of the competition commissioner and says, well, as long as it's a Peruvian company, I, I don't care. But if it's a US company, <laughs> so. Um, on the other hand, the US also sends these ambassadors uh, to all these countries from the antitrust agencies trying to get them to set up antitrust policy. So it's, it's a complicated back and forth. Uh, the Commerce Department's often in conflict with the uh, uh, antitrust agencies. Um, okay, so traditional antitrust policy tried to um, treat the entire industry uh, as a single product. And does anyone remember exactly how that worked? Gavitar? Exactly. Exactly. They tried to treat it all as if it was one product, and they just tried to define the boundaries of the industry, which products uh, were in the industry. And they would start by with the two firms that were merging, and adding firms um, that were the closest substitutes for those goods until uh, both geographically. So if these were like in one area of the country, you might add surrounding areas and in terms of the types of product until you achieve an industry that's of sufficient size so that somebody who is a monopolist over that industry would want to impose what's <coughs> called a small but significant and non-transitory increase in prices, which has come to be interpreted as raising prices by 5% for at least one year. Um, and that is how you defined what a market was. And then you measured the concentration of that market. And Connie, what was the standard measure of concentration that was used? Yeah, the four firm concentration ratio. Yeah, and what's the other one? The sum of the squares, yeah. So that's the most famous one that's called the Herfindahl Hirschman index. Um, so let's let the share of a firm be the fraction of quantity uh, in the total quantity in the industri industry, then the herfindahl hirschman index is the sum of the squared shares times 10,000. Um, one way of thinking about this is that 10,000 over H is sort of an approximation of the number of firms in the industry. And so we would think that this being less than th 3 to 5 is sort of like <coughs> the danger region. Now, that turns out to be a Herfindahl index of about uh, 3,000, you know, 2,000 to 3,000, which was way, way, way above where the agencies traditionally set uh, the danger thresholds. Um, you can relate this to markups that firms charge, because remember that every firm's markup is P prime times Q in the Cournot model. Uh, and so then their that will be equal to the price divided by the elasticity times their share. And so the share weighted markup is also going to be the Herfindahl index divided by 1,000 times the elas elasticity of the industry. Um, another way you can relate this is that it's the, sh it's the share weighted average share. And remember that the share was our theta value in the generalized Cournot model, the Cournot model with asymmetric firms. Okay, so the typical policy was that any merger that would cause H to go above 1800 or that raised it by 300 was viewed as potentially dangerous. Um, and again, notice that that's significantly below the danger region uh, from the perspective of Bresnahan and race, and so may have been somewhat aggressive from the perspective of those, uh, those studies. Okay. Um, yeah, Oliver. Is it like... I guess the Bresnahan and Race paper looked at. Like it's one very particular setting. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's like, is there much like external validity? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Depends what you think. I mean, we also don't have any knowledge of anything else. We don't have much other evidence. So, yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, this has proved very cumbersome in the real world, and the reason is that this market definition requires every product to either be in the market or out of the market. So a famous example of this was that there was a merger between wild oats and whole foods. And 
The question is, what's the market in which they exist? Is the market um, premium, organic food, uh, you know, grocery stores? If it was, then it was a merger to monopoly because these were the only two firms really offering that in most cities. On the other hand, it could have been all grocery stores, in which case they had a tiny market share and there was no concern. Uh, and of course, that seems like the wrong question to be asking, right? They were clearly very close substitutes for one another and many people's next best option was to go to the other place. So that seems like the more relevant question than whether you should call it a market or not. Um, and the relevance of concentration is also somewhat ambiguous. In fact, the best mergers in Cornell are ones that increase the concentration by the most because those are ones where the merging firms increase their quantities, right? And that's actually a good thing. So that was a little bit of a weird way of looking at things, right? And the new merger guidelines try to move away from this. Um, these are uh, announcements. So the merger guidelines have been coming out since the uh, early 80s. And these are announcements of the policies that the government will use to review uh, mergers. And they're issued roughly every 10 years. And the latest one was in 2010. And I was involved with this in the US and the UK. The last revisions had been based all on HHI and market definition, whereas the new ones emphasize the logic um, that I was just giving. Uh, in terms of like how close substitutes things are. And that's based explicitly on the, the differentiated products uh, model. Uh, the basic ideas behind this were designed by Joe uh, Farrell and Carl Shapiro, who were um, advisors to Obama on these issues and who became respectively the directors of the FTC and the DOJ uh, economics groups and thereby created guidelines that reflect these. Now, of course, the guidelines are constantly being updated, so this is very much an evolving uh, process. R recently, the UK did a report on conjectural variations and the role that that should play uh, in their policies, for example, rather than just looking at a Bertrand model. Sorry, what do you mean by conjectural variations? Like, what are the different possible... Conjectural variations was the thing we talked about last class, about the, like, tacit coordination, because I think someone else might change their price when I change mine. Okay. That it's not consistent with a Nash equilibrium? Because like, you can view it as like a couple of period games, is that? Yeah, so I view it as a reduced form static representation of, but I think all static models are representations of, so I just think Nash in anything is a silly way of thinking. I mean, it's not, <coughs> you know, in other words, like industries are not like. A, a static model, other than an instantaneous model, is not a good representation of any industry if you're going to take other people's prices as given. Because you know that on average when you change your prices, other people change their prices. That's why conjectural variations is a good way of summarizing those reactions that people expect. Okay, so let's look at the approach that lies behind uh, these changes to the merger guidelines. And the basic idea is that competition is often between products that are differentiated. And therefore, a merger doesn't um, eliminate products or firms. It just consolidates the ownership. Um, and the question is then, do, in that case, will a merger lead to an increase in prices? Or why would a merger lead to an increase in prices? Uh, Miles, do you have thoughts about that? <coughs> But imagine that there's no benefits. What's the basic logic of why the firms would raise prices if they have two differentiated products? Why would it give them an incentive to raise prices when they merge? Mm, yeah, but, but actually the product hasn't disappeared. Right? It's just been brought under the ownership of but the... But when you're going to the other one at that point, then you're still going to the same firm? Yeah, that, that, that's closer. So it's that there's an externality that the firms were exerting on each other, that, that when they lowered their price, they were taking goods from the other firm, 
right? And now they're going to internalize that externality, and that's going to lead them to want to raise their prices, right? Um, okay, so let's talk about the case of just two merging firms to <coughs> illustrate this. Um, and let's assume Nash and prices. So before the merger, firms were going to set their markup equal to the ratio of their quantity to the negative of the partial derivative of quantity with respect to price, which is sort of their marginal surplus. After the merger, theta is going to be equal to 1. And so they're going to set quantity uh, plus the markup of their good times the derivative of the markup of their good with respect to price plus the markup of the other good times the derivative of that uh, the other goods quantity with respect to their price. So they were neglecting this term before, and now they're including it. And uh, that's going to lead them to want to raise their price. So if we transform this back into terms like this, we get price equals marginal cost plus my marginal surplus from before if I divide it by uh, this, right? Plus the diversion ratio between our two goods. If I sell an additional unit of my good, how much comes from the other good firm's product times the markup? Why is that? Because every time I sell an additional unit of good, there's an additional cost that I'm now facing, which is that part of that good is not going to come from outside, but it's going to come from the other firm. And I'm going to lose the markup that I could have earned on that firm's price. Right? This is called upward pricing pressure. This is the added opportunity cost of a sale that results from the fact that we merged. Right? And this extra cost, we should intuitively think, will be passed through to consumers through increased prices. So the new merger guidelines um, ask uh, the agencies to measure exactly this upward pricing pressure. OK. Um, so this gives us a, a basic flavor of what we should be thinking about. But of course, we left out the existence of other firms in the industry. We left out conjecture, the possibility of conjectures or tacit coordination. And adding these two things in is uh, relatively simple, given what we've done before. We can just add the idea um, that uh, now when my, I change my price, I don't just change my price. I also might change the prices of all the other firms in the industry. And I could take that into account when I think about the effect that it will have on my quantity. So pre-merger, I will just take that all into account and set my markup equal to the ratio of quantity to however much I think my quantity is going to change when I change my price. Um, and post-merger, you're going to hold fix the prices of the other firms because you're taking those into account. Uh, your, it's under your control what the price of the other firm is, right? Um, and so we can now define a notion of how my quantity changes after the merger when I'm holding fixed the price of that other guy and how much, uh, yeah. And so then we're going to get my price is equal to marginal cost plus this new notion of uh, my marginal surplus which holds fixed the price of the other firm. Plus, now I have a diversion ratio, which is taken under this post-merger. What's how much of an additional good that I sell when I lower my price is coming from the other firm uh, uh, versus from the outside good? Glenn, yeah. You might be going like two slides. You're differentiating products. <laughs> yeah. So I don't I don't understand how your argument you made here justifies your claim that a merger won't eliminate the product. No, it doesn't. I'm just assuming that when you merge, the two products stay in the market. But they could, if the prices went of one went to infinity, that would effectively be eliminating the product. So I, I was sort of assuming that that's not what you're going to want to do. And I'm assuming that the technology for producing the product doesn't disappear. But firms might, in principle, want to eliminate a product if they have an incentive to take its price to infinity. I mean, it seems to me if you have two firms that have a basket of products and they merge, then you'd likely have them selling less products, fewer products than the that's, that's possible. I mean, this is not a very good model for dealing with that. No. But, but, but yeah. Sorry, I thought that was the claim you were trying to make on that slide. I didn't see how you No. Okay. Um, okay. So there are now basically two differences from the um, upward pricing pressure we discussed on the previous slide. So one, 
is that now the diversion ratio is uh, not the one um, that we had before, which was just the you know with partial derivatives. Now it's taking into account the fact that there's coordination, right? Um, the second is that now when I merge with a firm, uh, I'm going to hold their f price fixed, and so I no longer have these accommodating reactions from that other firm, and that might change my uh, my unilateral single product market power. Why is that? Um, well, intuitively, if we were already sort of colluding beforehand, then the merger is not as bad as it looks. Right? Um, okay. Uh, and this term will tend to be larger the bigger tacit coordination is between the two firms that merged and the rest of the industry. Why is that? Well, now, when I raise my price, other firms will raise their prices, and that will lead more of the um, goods that I, uh, that I, sorry, when I lower my price and, and other firms lower their prices in retaliation for that, now more of the goods that I get, that's going to reduce um, the amount of additional sales I get and it's going to increase the, uh, and it's also going to decrease the amount of Uh, sales lost by my rival. <coughs> Why is that? Um, okay, let me think about this again. Sorry. So when I lower my price, if I expect other people to accommodate, to uh, punish me by lowering their price, that's going to mean that lowering my price gives me fewer sales and that it um, and that the number of sales by my by the person that I just merged with The diversion ratio, I claim, when there's more coordination, is going to get higher because if I were to gain an additional sale, if I lower my price, I get fewer sales because other people retaliate against me. And my rival Ah, my rival is going to lose more sales because now everybody else is lowering their price as well. Both of those things make the diversion ratio higher, right? As a result, tacit coordination is going to make the diversion ratio higher if it's between the firms that are merging and the rest of the industry. Yeah, Oliver. Sorry. I, so you, you lower your price. Yeah. The other firm retaliates by lowering his not, price. Not the other firm that you're merging with because you're holding his price fixed. He's now part of you. Okay. So right? So it's only the other firms in the industry that are relevant for that. Okay. But then both of your prices are lower, so you both get more sales but look for lower profits, right? No. <coughs> you would get, you will get more sales. More higher Q but lower pi. No, no. But you're holding, or holding fixed your merger partner's price. Yeah. And we're just lowering my price. Okay. And then the question, that's going to, the fact that there's tacit coordination is going to reduce the number of additional sales that I get and increase the sales lost by my rival. So both of those forces will make my diversion ratio greater and therefore make the merger more anti-competitive. Right? And so tacit coordination between the two <coughs> firms that are merging and the rest of the industry makes uh, mergers more harmful. But on the other hand, if I was already coordinating with my partner, then the merger is less harmful because it was already taking place. So coordination between the two firms that are merging reduces the negative effects of a merger, but coordination between those firms and the rest of the industry makes uh, a merger more harmful. Yeah, Luke. So the thinking goes that post-merger, when I cut my prices, that'll hurt like my other leg, my other wing, my, the other company. Yeah. And so 
I don't see as much gain to that because exactly. part of my gain is coming from me. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. Okay. That's the diversion logic at yeah. its base. Exactly. Yeah, so Miles. How do you know the outside firm's response is going to be great, great enough to offset your gain? Well, it, do, it doesn't have to be. Uh, but, but the more that it is, the more that there is that tacit coordination, right? Because remember, we said that in collusion, if you lower your price, you get punished by the other guys. The more that there is that coordination, the stronger is going to be the negative effect of the merger if it's coordination between these firms and the rest of the industry. But if it's just these two firms coordinating with each other, that will actually make the merger more attractive. Because before you were getting the costs of them colluding, but not the benefits of the economies of scale, right? So you might as well let them merge. OK. So how do we actually measure all of this stuff in practice? Well, one way is internal company documents. So sometimes companies will say, oh, our, the w rival we're most worried about is this other guy. And that will tend to lead you to believe that their diversion ratio is higher, right? Because companies have to think all the time about who their rivals are. Um, surveys and internet data can also be useful. For example, you could ask consumers about, if you didn't buy this good, what would your second choice be? Right? Um, even better, online you can see people who almost bought this ended up buying this, or people who almost bought that ended up buying that. So you can see what are the products do consumers view as closest substitutes. That's something that hasn't been used that much in antitrust analysis, but I think would be really powerful. Win-loss studies and auctions as well. So if you if people are bidding for an auction and you see that when this guy wins, it's most likely this guy who's next, that can give you a sense that they're close substitutes for one another. Or you can build econometric models trying to do regressions using, say, shocks to cost and looking at when the price has changed, who does diversion occur from. Okay. Now, if you want to incorporate conjectures, uh, now a lot of the stuff isn't directly useful for conjectures except the stuff within companies, right? Because the stuff within companies might tell you, oh, I think they're going to change their prices in this way, uh, et cetera. However, another possibility was uh, proposed by Bresnahan. And they argue that firms form their conjectures based on their experience. So if when uh, cost goes up, the firm raises its price, the firm is then going to see what happens uh, with all the other firms' uh, prices. And so we could use historical shocks to cost, incorporating what happened to all the other firms' prices, and use that as a way of judging um, what the firm thinks will happen to its quantity when it changes its price. Because its own conjectures are probably based on that historical experience. right? I think that's a pretty reasonable way to determine the conjectures. And this is called the consistent conjectures hypothesis. In some sense, the other models are a little bit strange, right? The firm has seen its price go up and seen it reduce its quantity. Uh, and it saw how much the price changed in response to that. But that's not what the firm thinks about in the Cournot model. It thinks about what would have happened if in response to my changing my quantity, the firm, other firms hadn't responded and changed their quantities, right? So, and plus, this makes things a lot empirically easier. Because in the other models, you have to get a bunch of shocks which allow you to change this one firm's price while holding all the other prices fixed. Whereas in this case, all you need is one shock that changes this firm's price, and then you can let everything else adjust, and that gives you the right effect. Um, and in fact, this is what Baker and Bresnahan did in their 1985 paper to measure uh, the effects of a merger, was they could do it with only a small number of cost shocks because they used the consistent conjectures idea, and therefore could have everyone uh, adjusting all their price uh, quantities in equilibrium. Yeah? So you were saying that they say, okay, so I have a price, I call shocks, I raise the price, yeah. and I see how much I raise their prices. Yeah. And then you, but I mean, how can they separate out, so if I get a call shock, presumably they, you know, would have the same cost shock. Oh, well, if, if, yeah, if you can't get a clean cost shock, then it's no good. But it's no good to measure it anyway, econometrically, if you don't have a clean cost shock for all so the firms. So you have to look at a strike for your own workers and say Yeah, exactly. That. Exactly. That's what they tried to do in, in the beer industry. Exactly. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. When you say that for not to change your quantity, uh, the rival, but you don't take into account that the rival will change also. The yeah. The equilibrium for not is a nice equilibrium, so in a nice equilibrium you, you take the. No, you don't, because you hold as fixed everybody else's quantities. But that's not 
equilibrium is like the crossing point of the... Holding point. fixed everybody else's quantities. I mean, it's, it's an equilibrium of people who take as given other people's quantities. Just... Uh, yeah. Left. Yeah. Yes. Um, if, if you merge, you take as <coughs> given the price of the firm you merge with. Yes. But if, if there's different, like, cost structures, yes. how does that work? Because you might want to... Oh, so one thing we didn't account for in here was, like, efficiencies. That, like, the costs of the firms might change when they merge. Uh, that can be taken into account here as well by like a change in marginal cost or just a change in fixed cost. And you can put that through all the same stuff. We just didn't talk about that. So here it's like under the symmetric case where you have like the same marginal cost or? or no, or just like the marginal costs don't change as a result of the merger. Like the firms keep doing whatever they're doing. I mean, they might change how much they're producing of each of the goods, but their costs don't change. Okay. So we may not uh, want just to know this opportunity cost, we might also want to know how much prices change. But we know how to translate changes in cost into changes in prices just by multiplying by the pass-through rate, right? Now there are two relatively small but real complications here, one of which is that mergers push up both merging firms' prices, not just one firm's prices. And so you need to think not just about the own pass-through, but also how pass-through occurs across the two products. It's also uh, the case that other firms will raise their prices uh, as a result of these firms increasing their prices. And so therefore we need to use sort of a pass-through matrix which says how much does increase in the cost of these firms, the, those opportunity costs coming from the merger lead to increase in prices of all the firms in the industry. Right? So then you can just multiply the pricing pressure by the pass-through matrix to get the change in prices. Um, now you don't really need to follow all of these matrices exactly, uh, but uh, basically it just is a generalization of this stuff to allow for all the effects that it has on all the firms. Okay. So um, how much uh, does this change in um, prices hurt consumers? Well, by the envelope theorem, right? We can just multiply the change in prices by the quantities the consumers are currently purchasing. Uh, and quantities are probably the easiest of all these things to measure because we can just see them. In fact, a simple way to do this is to create a price index where you do price multiplied by quantity as the denominator. Uh, that's sort of like a quantity, that's like a quantity weighted average percent increase in price. And then you can do the change in price uh, from this formula. Yeah, same. Uh, is that a uh, vector product? Yeah, sorry, it's not a cross product. It's a, it's just a normal dot. Normal, just uh, a matrix product. Okay. How about the changes in social welfare uh, rather than consumer welfare? Zafang, how, how would we figure that out? Look up. Sorry. Uh, here we figure out the change in consumer welfare. How would we figure out the change in look up? Uh, how would we figure out the change in social welfare? What, what were the formulas we had for the change in social welfare uh, when something changes in an in industry with market power? So here we did the quantities times the change in price. What do we do to get the change in social welfare? Remember the incidence formulas we had? When you were doing consumer welfare, it was quantity times change in price. For social welfare, what was it? <coughs> Anybody else? Anybody else remember what we did to get, uh, to get the change in social welfare in, in like the social incidence formula? So, so consumer surplus is quantity times change in price. What's social welfare? Well, that's th that was like the incidence thing, but but for the social incidence, like to figure out like what is what is the change in social welfare when something changes in an industry with market power? Yeah, Vitter. Like yeah. No, but that's the incidence again. That um, so it's the markups. Those are the set of all wedges times the changes in quantities. 
right? So to get the consumer surplus, we did the quantities times the change in price. Here it's the change in the quantity times the markup. And we can derive the changes in the quantity from the changes in the price by multiplying by the derivatives of demand um, if we have those. Okay. Yeah. Why is there a negative one on the change transpose consumer surplus? Because if prices rise, consumers are hurt. Right? Okay. So the nice thing about translating these not just into price changes as UPP does, sorry, not just into like how much pressure there is on prices, but all, actually to all these welfare numbers, is that in principle we could incorporate some of the other effects which are measured in units of welfare, right? So, um, for example, the changes in quality, we could translate via the analysis we had before into changes in welfare. Or some of the political effects, we might be able to translate into that. Uh, selection effects also will be measured in units of welfare, not just units of price change, because we know price changes could actually be good under advantageous selection. And trying to incorporate all these things into merger analysis is a very exciting active area of research that I know some people here are interested in. Uh, so um, happy to talk more about that.